the volume nice and loud. Because we are controlling transmissions with dance beats and r and You're in the mix with Lil Drummer Girl with your host, Dawn Marie. Hey there, it's Dawn Marie Mutel here, and welcome to another episode of The Little Drummer Girl. Tonight's guest is Ken Mary. Ken is not only a drummer, but he's also a producer, engineer, singer, writer, and record executive. He's written over 35 albums that combined to hold 5 million copies worldwide. The list of artists he's worked with is endless, but to name a few, he was a drummer for Alice Cooper. He had his own band called The House Boards, which was intertwined with the one and only Gene Simmons from the band Kiss. He's worked and produced with producers and engineers of top bands like Fred Zeppelin, Vagrants the Machine, Nine Inch Nails, Aerosmith, and so many more. He's even worked with John Stamos on two episodes of the Full House TV show. Some of the labels he's worked with include RCA, MCA, Epic, CBS, Atlantic, you name it, he's worked with. He currently is the president of VSR Music Group, which is distributed by Capitol Records, and he runs his own recording studio called Sonic Fit. He's also been asked to be the host of the movie, The Drumming Hall of Fame. And since we have such little time and we have a lot to cover, let's get Ken on the air. Hey, Ken, how's it going this evening? I'm great. How are you doing, Don Marie? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. You know, I want to thank you so much for being here because I think it's truly an honor that I'm thrilled because I think, well, you rock. And since we, we have such a little bit of time together, is it okay if we dive right in and rock out? Absolutely. All right. My first question, how old were you when you first began playing drums? Was it your first instrument that you ever played? It was, actually. And I started playing when I was 11 years old. And I, I believe the seed for wanting to play drums started much, much earlier. I remember as being as young as five years old and just hanging around on pots and pans on desks with pencils and, you know, really anything I could get my hands on. So at that point, uh, when you get into, I think, fifth grade at that time, they would ask you if you wanted to play an instrument, and I was like, absolutely. How about drum? <laughs> so that's how it started. Um, it was really in the school system, so that's that's where that's where my start began. That, that's wonderful. Uh, did your family support your decision to play and become a musician? Yeah, I, I had a, actually, you know, my dad was gone when I was very young, but my mother was extremely supportive, and I won't say we were a poor family, but we certainly um, were, I'd say, uh, maybe lower uh, middle class. We didn't have a lot of money, and I just remember um, my mother being extremely supportive uh, uh, to the point where she took $150 that we really didn't have time, and she bought me my first drum kit. Uh, oh, that's yeah, fantastic. It, it really was. I mean, having a, a parent support you like that and, you know, be, being willing to take that kind of risk that you're even going to continue playing the drum, pretty amazing looking back. That's very true, because kids, you know, they change their mind like the weather. So. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Were there some bands that you did that really influenced your playing? Well, there certainly was. I mean, I had a, a teacher named Dick Stensland, and he exposed me from everything from Yes to Return to Forever to Yes to, you know, just all kinds of music, jazz, Buddy Rich, um, Louis Belson, uh, you know, really gave me a great background on, on pretty much uh, Latin dials, you know, just a whole range of, of musical vocabulary. So he was something, someone that was very instrumental in terms of giving me a large... Uh, uh, I guess you use a color palette to work from. I had a lot of different styles I could draw from, a lot of different techniques. I played with both traditional grip and mass grip. Uh, so for me, it was, uh, you know, I, I'd say that, that was a very important beginning because I think with a lot of drummers today, if you have a teacher, they're going to focus on one specific thing. Like, there wasn't one specific thing I focused on. I mean, I was really into rudimental drumming as well. So, you know, it was everything from marching to jazz to rock to fusion, and it really I, I think it did make me uh, a, little, a better player, and I think it also um, made me a little bit unique in the fact that I was able to fuse a lot of things into straight, straight on rock that maybe hasn't been used in the past. So that's pretty tremendous. How old were you when you started studying? I was, I believe, 12 when I started studying. I see, we were fairly young. Yeah, I would say, I guess by today's standards, I, I guess that's considered old, I suppose. I always thought it was young myself, but but yeah, I guess I guess you know when you have people that are starting to play drums at five years old, and six years old now, and they actually have a drum kit and they can look at YouTube and see all these great drummers do their thing. Well, we didn't. We had you know, we had to listen to records and try and figure out what they were doing. So I hear you. I go down to my brother who was seven years old and you know, turning me on to Alice Cooper when I was like nine years old. And uh, speaking of Alice Cooper, I'm gonna. 
jump ahead for a second. How, how did you end up getting the tour with Alice? Getting on tour with him? What was the break? Sure, I could tell you how I ended up getting the audition because they auditioned. They, I think they went to three days of auditioning drummers, and I was playing at a club called the Lithia Go Go in Los Angeles with another oh, artist, yeah. uh, an artist named Randy Hansen who was doing a, a Hendrix tribute at the time, and this is, I want to say, 80... I guess this was 86. And um, some people from Alice's management company uh, or people that were working with Alice's management company were at the show, and, and they were like, wow, you know, we're re- really impressed with your playing. Would you be interested in coming down and, and auditioning for Alice's new band? And I was like, absolutely. You know, would you, would you fly me down? Because I live in Seattle, and... They were like, well, we're not flying anybody down, but um, you're certainly welcome to <laughs> certainly welcome to come down and, and audition. And so, being really young and having to pay for the uh, plane flight was kind of a a little bit of a risk. You know, you had to roll your your uh, dice and take your chance at that point. But um, I, I did audition and obviously got the gig. And the next thing I knew, the biggest place I had played at that point, I think, was probably about. 3,000, 4,000 people. And then with Alice, we rehearsed for a couple months, and then we were playing sold-out Coliseums all across the world. So it was a pretty huge uh, jump up from, you know, playing a club or that kind of, you know, small theaters and clubs to all of a sudden, you know, sold-out Coliseums. It was, it was a great experience. That's incredible. I mean, it really is. So you were you were in another band at the time with your own band that was signed to the label at the time with Am I correct about that? Yeah, I was actually when I when I um, got the gig with Alice, I also had my own band called Fifth Angel, which signed to Epic Records at the time. And so um, we did have a band meeting about it, and we talked about it. And we decided, hey, I guess it's better that we, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do this tour, and I'll promote Fifth Angel while I'm on the tour. And, and it was actually kind of a good. I think it was a good thing for all parties because I was able to go to Europe and have a few interviews with uh, really a large number of magazines that. We probably wouldn't have had access to and even back in that day it really was something where if you weren't there, you know, they really wouldn't interview you. you know, now you have Skype, you have whatever, you know, you can do things over the internet pretty easily. But back then if you weren't there, you know, they really they really wouldn't tend to interview. I mean you can do phone interviews obviously and that kind of thing. And even those are still far and few in between, you know. Well, I think for the magazines to take you seriously, they they wanted to, you know, meet you, see you, and, you know, get some sort of personal time, and then they would take your project a lot more seriously. So I think it did help us quite a bit in terms of the press that we were able to get. And, you know, just the fact that I had played in Alice gave us some instant credibility as well. So I think I think it worked all, uh, fairly well all the way around. So what was your first break that actually landed you the record deal with Epic Records with your first band? Well, we, did somebody uh, come out and watch you at a gig? Um, they actually did a funny story. An album through Shrapnel Records who had a distribution deal in Europe with a very small company at the time called Roadrunner. I don't know if you know what... I remember were. them. Well, n- now they have bands like Nickelback and Slipknot. They're a massive company. But back then, they were this tiny little label out of the Netherlands and so I was on the phone with a guy named Chase Wessel, who still runs the company today. And, you know, I was, you know, just a kid at the time. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking to him about, you know, negotiating contracts and that kind of thing. So it was, it was actually pretty funny. But, uh, um, you know, Mike Varney and I used to be on the phone and we'd talk about the, you know, the different deal and, and what the percentages were and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we were kids, but I think we, we definitely took the business very seriously. And so anyways, the album came out on um, Roadrunner and started selling very well in Europe. And the next thing you know, we were getting calls from Epic Records and some other companies, and they were interested in coming down. So Epic, um, the A&R guy, basically just came down to rehearsal and made sure that we could play. And, and they signed us to like a seven album, I think it was at the time, was like a $26 million deal or something if we fulfilled all nine records or something. Wow, that's fabulous. Yeah, it was kind of a, it was one of those things where I think the band was super talented and, and uh, you know, just good guys in the band and we worked hard and, and uh, we were 
kind of in the right place at the right time and, and, had, and caught a nice break, I guess you could say. <laughs> that's wonderful. I mean, that's one of the hardest things that I think people face these days is, you know, as artists and musicians that are just trying to make it in the business. And, and I always say, you know, it's really, really, really difficult to, to make it. And it's great that you can do things independently these days where you don't necessarily have to rely on a label, that you can go out and, you know, process your own uh, CDs and, and get them out, you know. But it's, it's great having that label to back you financially because they can just do so much more, obviously. With yeah, absolutely. the budgets that they have. Yeah, I think there's a misconception now that labels aren't really necessary anymore, and that's not completely true. I mean, if you're doing something successful on your own, okay, chances are you've already built an infrastructure similar to a label. You know, chances are you have some relationships at radio, you have relationships with your fan base, and that's the kind of thing that, you know, people think a label isn't that important. Well, it, it still is, because if you're talking about the relationships that they've built over you know, 60 or 70 years at radio stations, with with uh, managers, with concert promoters. I mean, all the different access that they have to high-level professionals, it's going to be substantially different than the access that just an individual artist will have. The labels, I still think, play a very important role. I think it's, it's diminishing just because the revenue is diminishing so dramatically, but that's, that's a whole other story. <laughs> that is a whole other story. Um, when I was a music publisher with MCA Music, I mean, that was my job was to protect the writers and, you know, try to get them all their funds, especially when, you know, sampling had just started and there were no really, like, any rules out there. And they were like, all right, Tomarie, let's make some deals. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so uh, trying to protect writers is so important and uh, making sure. But now everything, you know, is bootleg and it's, it's sad when artists are getting ripped off from their hard work and I'm just against that. Well, I think, I think we're in an era where, you know, if you're a musician, I think you do have to recognize something that, that is very different. I think that you, you do have to recognize that music is essentially free to anybody that wants to utilize it that way. I mean, you have YouTube. I mean, I don't, I don't know last time, honestly, um, that I do some conferences for some of the colleges in Arizona. And they'll bring their class down, and we'll we'll talk about these. Um, so we'll talk about some of the changes in the music industry. And I'll ask the students. I'll say, you know, how many of you have purchased music in the last week or month or year? And it's amazing to me how many people. There are a few people in the class that tend to have a subscription with Spotify or Pandora, but most people just look at YouTube, and that's what they use as their as their uh, music player, essentially. Well, that's why you yeah, see artists with, you know, 100 million views. Like, I looked at Sia the other day, and she has 1.3 billion views. And why is that? That's because people are listening to that video and then putting it through, you know, like, let's say it's on their iPhone. They're plugging it into the auxiliary of their car, and they're just making a playlist and and not paying for the music, you know, which is sad because these artists do give such a tremendous amount um of themselves and, and put so much of themselves into the music and it is art and you know you do have to support art but I think if you're an artist nowadays you have to recognize that your revenue is going to be coming from live performances merchandise and really not so much for music at all that's a very interesting point right there I mean, how did you tra- make the transition from being a drummer into a producer slash engineer well it was early a fairly natural progression for me. I, I did have the opportunity to work alongside some of the greatest recording engineers and producers in the business. Guys like Andy Johns, who uh, did all the tracking for Led Zeppelin. Um, guys like Michael Wagner, who sold 60 million albums. Um, guys like Garth Richardson. Uh, I mean, there's just a whole... Uh, guys like uh, Mac, who who produced Queen. I mean, there's just so many great um, producers that I was able to work with as a drummer and band member and writer that it was something that was always of interest to me. And so I really paid attention to those producers when I had the opportunity to work with them. And so there was a certain point in the business, I think it was around, I guess, 96, 97, when I started producing my own music. And there's some friends of mine that had heard it and they were like, hey, you know, we have a band. Would you be interested in producing our band? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? I had built my own studio. I had my own, um, it was a fairly small studio at the time, but I did have some of the earlier versions of ADAS 
Mac and Pro Tools and that kind of thing. And so it was fairly well equipped and it had good mics and, and uh, didn't really have much in the way of a console, but it, it wasn't super important in that at that time. Um, so I just started producing for a couple other artists, and next thing I knew, they started getting picked up by record companies, and lo and behold, you know, I was a quote-unquote producer. So. <laughs> So was this all in analog or digital? This is all, well, it's, I would say it's a little bit of a hybrid. I did have an analog console, but it was digital recording. This is the era where ADAT, I don't know if you remember that era, but they were, they recorded on a format. It was like, they would actually use videotapes and they would record digitally. Do you remember ADAT at all or probably not? No, that doesn't ring a bell to me. Okay, it's just a, it was just a recording format that worked for, I guess it was around for probably about eight or nine. And Pro Tools came in and, and kind of changed the game dramatically by, you know, making um, computer-based recording uh, really efficient and really effective with plugins and all of that. So um, we moved to Pro Tools now, and, you know, now we're a full SSL, analog, and digital facility. So um, we're, we're kind of marrying the best of both worlds. We're we're using analog in terms of the processing, in terms of uh, the preamps and, the, and, and going into Pro Tools, and then we're also mixing through an analog console coming out of Pro Tools, sometimes going to half-inch tape. So we are oh, still I'm utilizing sorry. some of the classic techniques. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. I thought you might have lost me there for a second. No, I have Um Speaking of which, uh, you, you're working on a new project right now, Rush to Revolution. Can you tell us about this uh, project? Sure. Um, first, for me, I was just looking around, and it is it is an era, just like we were talking about, where music is free, so there's really no financial motivation for me to do this, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, I, I think I'm just to the point where, you know, I, I produce, I really love producing, and I, and I love production, and I've produced for so many artists, and you, you get to a point where you kind of go like, well, you know, I have something to say too, and I'm not, you know, I'm not. I have a studio at my at my fingertips. I have all of this access, all this gear, and all this knowledge, and I haven't really used it for myself in years and years. And I, and I, for the first time, I feel kind of inspired to actually create something from an artistic perspective. So that's really what it comes down to. I really feel like making a statement, drumming wise, and also, um, you know, just. Just lyrically, um, I think there's a lot going on in the world that we can be talking about that has a little bit more depth to it than, than maybe what we're talking about, if that makes sense. It does, and I love what you said, how you're going back to like the good old days where you're not going to have any beat detective and no auto-tunes or no editing the time and the track. Can you explain what that phrase means? Yeah, it just means that I think... It's a very different world, and sometimes nowadays we have artists, and I'm sure everybody knows examples of this. I'm not going to use any specific examples because I don't think that would be appropriate, but I, I'm sure we've all seen artists where we listen to a record and we go, wow, this artist is incredible, and then you go see them live, and it has nothing to do, like they don't sound anything, you know, they're completely out of pitch, and you know, they're just not talented. <laughs> And that's the world we that's the world we live in now with Pro Tools where you can literally create something that doesn't actually exist. You've got drummers that can be sound tremendous on album that maybe aren't that good. You have vocalists that maybe can't sing well and maybe can't stay on pitch that can be completely brought into pitch and be made to sound um, you know, it is like they, they're like they're amazing singer when they're actually not. So I think what I was trying to get get, get you in that statement was, you know, I just want to get back to the idea of it's the recording studio, not the repair facility. Because and young artists know this. I mean, I, I've worked with young artists where, you know, I'll just give an example. You know, I was working with one musician where, you know, the track wasn't that good. You know, we were just tracking one of the instruments. And uh, and I said, well, let's take them to the top. And the and the the reaction of the musician was, well, well, can't you just fix it in Pro Tools? And <laughs> that's that's the, that's the mindset of people now. It's like they know that you can take something and you can just fix it up and magically make something that sounds great, even though they didn't play it. And I think that that's something that I think has actually harmed the level of musicianship. So. I do notice, I will say this though, I do notice there are a lot of new, younger bands coming out 
that are amazing that I'm like watching, you know, some of the talent level of some of these guys and they're coming out with amazing, innovative, incredible, uh, techni- incredibly technically difficult music and it's, it's exciting. It's, it's exciting to see something, um, authentic. Really... <laughs> What's that? Authentic. Yeah, well, it's just, you know, we're getting back to the idea that, hey, you know, we're, we, we can be, you know, talented musicians and do something interesting instead of just, you know, repeating the same old four chords and writing another pop song. So I think it's kind of really exciting to see that, you know, we're getting back to the idea that, hey, let's get some musicians that can really play and really perform and create some interesting and unique music as well. So I think it's, it's kind of a, it's a nice time and the nice, the reason I think I, I began, uh, the process of creating my own project was just because I feel like there's no commercial, you don't have to fit into a box anymore. You can do whatever you want because it's all free. <laughs> so true. I love that and it, it is true and that's why I always say, you know, being authentic and true to yourself these days and, you know, not pretending to be something that you're not or, want to be in, you know, it's just amazing. Um, can you please let me know when your uh, album is out and release so that I can let our listeners know and maybe put up a link to it so people can pick it up and take a listen? Sounds great. All right. Um, I think we have something in common. We, we both have some uh, bad back issues, yet you still play. How did you hurt your back, and what did you do to recover and be able to continue to play? That's a great question, and I think it is something very important for young young drummers to learn from my mistakes, because I think that you can avoid back problems just by using, um, there's one piece of gear that I don't have an endorsement with, so there's no financial motivation of me saying this, but I use, the only drum stool I use right now is the Rock and Sock Motion Throne, and that, that drum stool has literally changed my life. Like, if I didn't have that piece of gear it would be very difficult for me to play as much as I'm playing now without without having pain because there was a time where it was so painful to, to play where I would get up from playing and have a hard time, like, walking. So, because um, I do have a couple of degenerative discs in the back. I think it was from an automobile accident when I was younger. I believe that's where the injury came from, but didn't, it did not show up till much, much later, and that's the kind of thing with car accidents is I... I don't think they show up till till much longer. I, I don't think drumming is honestly really helpful for your back, just because if you think about what you're doing, you know, you're putting all that pressure on the spine, you're lifting your legs, so all of that pressure is on your lower back. And so, so using the right equipment, I think, is is very important. I think also um, just exercising regularly, strengthening your core, like those kind of things. I went through physical therapy that helped a tremendous amount. So all of those things combined allows me to pretty much, like now I, I play pain free and I haven't had any problems in um, probably a couple that's of years. That's good. That's awesome. I have to uh, pick up one of those because I, I hadn't heard of that and uh, the rock and sock because I go through bouts where, you know, I mean, thankfully, since I moved to Florida, it's been a lot better because I get to swim every day and work out in the pool. But, um, you know, when I played for periods of time, it would be like, oh my gosh, you know, like you say, you know, it stiffens up this and that, and you get off the throne, and you're like, uh-oh, Houston, we have a problem, and um, so I have to actually put up a link to that, too, uh, in the show notes, because let me see if Amazon carries it, because I think that's a great piece of equipment, I would definitely like to share that information. Yeah, it really is, and the thing, it's a little weird to get used to, I mean, I'll, I'll just give you a heads up, it does... It is true to the name motion throne. It actually moves around, so your back is never fixed in one position the whole time. It does kind of move back and forth, and so it's a little odd to get used to. Like, it takes, I'd say, probably like a few days to a week to get used to it, but, but I don't even notice that now. Like, it doesn't even it doesn't even cross my mind. I never even think about it, but when I first sat down on it, I was like, wow, how am I, how am I going to possibly play while I'm moving around? And it right, yeah, it does sound really strange. Yeah, it's a little weird to get used to, but it, you get used to it really quickly, and now it's like I don't have one. I'm just like, you know, it's I just absolutely recommend it 100%. It really, it really is a game changer if you have back problems. It really will help. 
I definitely can't wait to try it because I've tried, you know, so many things in therapies and you name it. I've had everything done. But I've been dealing, I got hit by a drunk driver when I was 21, so, or 22. And so, like, and then a couple other people hit my car, you know, a few years after that. So it just was, like, endless. Um, but it, it really sucks because, you know, you want to play. I used to be able to play out 16 hours of practice. Yeah, great, play all day. And then it was like, oh, an hour? Hmm, that's a toughie. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, so that, I can't wait to pick that up. Thank you for telling me about really that. really definitely try that for sure. I'm trying to think of what else helps. I mean, occasionally, uh, yeah, that's about all I'd really feel comfortable recommending. There is a product that's not FDA approved that a lot of athletes use, and I'll just leave it at that, but that's another thing that, you know, for lower back stuff, um, if somebody's really interested, they could probably figure out what that is. But, <laughs> but, I'm thinking uh, it's like one of those belts that they, you know, the pack support belts that they have out there for weightlifters. Well, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a belt. It's actually a product that you, you know, it's like a lotion that you rub into the skin, but um, <laughs> it's, it's, again, it's not FDA approved, so I don't think I'd, I'd want to yeah. talk about it. But, but I do know that athletes, you know, football players, basketball players use it all the time. And um, if somebody just Googles that, I'm sure they'll find out what it is. But that's it's, it's <laughs> something that also so that's something that also helps. I mean, I'm I'm just trying to think of you know if you is it, are your problems lower back or upper back? I have my lower back, and then I have like I think it's three discs in my neck that are messed up as well. You know, you go through those injection series and things like that, and it feels good for like you know three or four months, and then you're like, all right, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> and so you don't want to keep taking those injections because, you know, they have side effects and all that. So I try to do everything naturally, and that's why swimming to me is really huge because I can really get a great workout in the pool where I couldn't do it on land if I want. Sure. So that's been, that's been great. Actually, I do have one more question before I answer the next segment, but have you ever made any mistakes or had any embarrassing moments on stage? If so, how did you get out of it? Well, I think everybody makes mistakes uh, on stage. I think it's... The one thing I think that people don't realize is that it's very difficult to discern that somebody made a mistake if you're in a 16,000 seat. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> unless, unless it's something glaring, unless it's something really blatant, it's, it's really difficult for people to tell. And, you know, we learned kind of early on that as long as you're performing well and, you know, you're, you're, you're playing well, I mean, Going back and listening to some of the live recordings, I think generally speaking, we were pretty, uh, you know, pretty spot on. I didn't really hear a lot of mistakes out of anybody, but um, even if you do make a mistake, I think it's really difficult for most people to tell. And so I, I try not to get um, too crazy about that kind of thing. I, there's no real embarrassing moments that I can think about in terms of, um, you know, a, a situation where, like, I really messed something up or something, you know, went wrong. I mean, there were a couple times where some of the props had problems. Uh, you know, one time we had <laughs> some fake blood all over the stage that one of our guitar players was sliding all over the place on. And um trying to think of what else happened. I mean, one time I tossed a drumstick up in the air and there was a lighting truck about 10 feet above me and it just got, it just got stuck in it and didn't come back down. That was, uh, That's good. <laughs> that was kind of amusing, you know, because I, you know, I used to play and toss them, and you know, I wasn't really even watching for them because I knew where they were going to come down, so I wouldn't really, I, I didn't really have to, to watch that much, and so I tossed it up, and I'm like, it just didn't come down, and so I looked at it, and it stuck in the truck. It was, it was that's pretty a, funny. But it was kind of funny, actually. I was like, okay, that's funny. How did it actually get, how did it manage to actually get stuck in there? I have no idea, but, but it did manage to Just the it. right amount of space to just catch it well <laughs> and grab hold, and that's it, not coming back. I'm just glad it didn't fall back down later, because that would have been probably fine. Oh, that wouldn't have been good. <laughs> I'm sure it would have hurt, too, in the process. So, are you ready for the 11th Stroke Roll Rapid Fire interview? I'm going to ask you 11 quick questions. Sure. I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Awesome. Your favorite drum set? Favorite drum set. Uh, Ludwig, Chrome on Wood. Favorite drum set? Uh, Vader Fusion. Favorite food? Orange chicken at Cheesecake Factory. Ooh. Dine in or take out? Dine in. Favorite travel spot? Hawaii. Cool. From my list. Favorite person to hang out with? My wife. What? Your favorite pastime? Favorite pastime. Um, my new favorite pastime is boating. I like boating. Sweet. Your favorite tour? Favorite tour? That's a tough one because I really enjoyed all of them, and I had a number. I'd say it would definitely be in the European theater 
Um, I'd say probably the first Alice tour would, would probably, I, I'd, I'd say that was probably my favorite tour because, you know, it was my first major, major tour and the, the excitement level on that tour was, was phenomenal. And it, and it was a hugely successful tour, so I'd say that was probably my favorite. Which album was that from? That was Raise Your Fist and Yell, which was, uh, actually, no, I'm sorry, the album was on that tour was Constrictor, uh, and that was, I think he's back, The Man Behind the Mask, which was for, uh, I think, a Friday the 13th movie or something was the main theme song. I met him once at the Ritz. I don't know if you were there for that, but that was in probably like 90 when he did the Trash album. Yeah, that wasn't, I wasn't on that tour. I was on okay. the Yell and the Constrictor tour. And I met him um, at the Ritz, and I just I would love to get him on the show. So I don't know how challenging that would be. I'm sure it's pretty challenging, but it would be great. Car or motorcycle? Definitely car. And your favorite band of all time? That's a really tough one. Um, favorite band of all time. Wow. I'd like to get a lifeline on this one. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> that's, a different, that's a different show. Uh, it's so tough. Honestly, to, to just nail it down to one band of all time would be so How tough. about one of your favorite bands? Well, one of my favorite bands, and I'd ever done, I have a funny story about it. I discovered them in the late 80s, because uh, it was a little bit before my time, but Led Zeppelin. Uh, I was on a flight <laughs> to Europe, and I had a, a one of the early portable DVD players, and I had just bought Led Zeppelin for on CD, and I was I was listening on the flight and just going, wow, this is amazing. So I go to my bass player, Chuck, I said, I was like, dude, you got to check this out. These guys are unbelievable. And he looked at me, and he goes, oh, you just figured out who Led Zeppelin was, huh? And I went back to my seat, and I said, well, yep, I guess I just did. <laughs> That's really sweet. That's, that's very cool. That was like, <laughs> so you guys got to check this out. Yeah, we know. We know who Led Zeppelin is, yeah. We <laughs> okay, well, what part of the world did you grow up in? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What rock did you live under? What is your biggest pet peeve? Uh, biggest pet peeve. Wow. Um, tailgater. Mm. Two mile an hour, like, on your bumper. I can't stand that. Mm-hmm. I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> I'm a New York driver, so it's, it's, I'm usually watching people five cars ahead of me and honking them because I've been hit so many times. So tell me, do you have any pearls of wisdom for those that are looking to break into the business? Yeah, I, I do, actually. The process is very similar to what it was even for my high school band getting signed, and that is if you can prove your product viability, if you build your own fan base, if you put out product, if you tour, if you do all the things that you have to do to, to build that fan base, then you take the guesswork out of it for the label. Because I think ultimately you do need a label. I mean, there's no major artist that you can probably say that doesn't have a major label behind them. I mean, every single major artist you're going to look are all going to be on a major label. So if you want to be, if you want to be at that level of visibility, that's really going to require a record company. So the way I look at it is, you have to get them to invest in you, much like a bank is going to invest in a business. So build your business, make it viable, prove that you can get airplay on radio, prove that you have a fan base, prove that you can draw people live. Once you do that, it's a different conversation with the with the red company at that point because then they're gonna they're gonna be looking for you. You're not gonna have to look out. I love it. That's fantastic advice. You know when you think about it, even my high school band, we did exactly that. We made a great product, we were picked up by a small label, we started selling records, then we got picked up by a bigger record company and in the process it really is the same today. I mean you'd have to put out product, you have to you have to start selling product and you have to have some visibility and then if you do then and labels will be knocking on your door. That is so true. Ken, will you be in the Tampa area anytime soon? Uh, I don't know. You never do know. I don't have any plans off the top of my head, but, but if I am, if I am, if I do end up going there, I'll certainly call it. I want to thank you for joining us and inspiring us tonight. Thanks so much, Don Marie. Um, how can our listeners follow you and stay in touch with you? Are you on social media? Is there a specific website they should go to? Well, they can go to sonicfish.com, which is S-O-N-I-C-C-H-I-S-A.com. Uh, that's our official website for the studio. They can also reach me at uh, Ken K. Mary on Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram. What, what, do we, what do we call it? I think we call it Insta Twit Face or something like that. <laughs> We joke about that because it's all, you know, yeah, we're on all the different social media platforms. So if you just, um, I'm sure if you just do a search for Ken Mary or Ken K. Mary, something will come up. And, cool. and I'll 
easily contact me that way. Uh, I do actually try to stay on top of that in terms of I do try to respond to people when they do have questions, and I try to be helpful when I can. I mean, sometimes I don't have the time, but, but when I do, I, I certainly try to be as helpful as I can. Well, that's awesome, and I will put the um, links to those in the show notes so the book can uh, follow in you. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. Thanks, Don Marie. Have a fantastic evening. <laughs> thank you. And to those listening out there this evening, thank you again for being here, and if you like this episode, please share it and subscribe. And we can also be found on SoundCloud and Stitcher Radio under the Little Drummer Girl. That's L-I-L Drummer Girl. And remember, it's never too late to live the life of your dreams and leave a trailblazing behind you. So rock on and rock out. And until the next time, I'll catch you on the flip side. Namaste. Namaste.